I see that people are still logging in. My name is Charlene Margo, and I'm co-founder of Nonprofit The Parent Venture, the organization that produces the Parent Education Series now in its 16th year. We are so delighted to have you all with us tonight for a very special, special event with Frank Bruni and Alice Kleeman. If we were in person, like last time, this would be a fireside chat, but instead we're going to have a virtual Zoom chat. Really looking forward to tonight. We know that this conversation is an important one with more than 950 registered attendees, a new record for this program. Obviously, the topic has really resonated with you all. We're going to be talking about making the most of the college experience. So this is beyond being admitted. Um, this is actually a conversation that we have been talking about having for more than a year. So we could not be more excited to be bringing you this program tonight. Before I get started, I want to thank our sponsors, the Menlo Atherton High School PTA, the Sequoia Union High School District, Sequoia Healthcare District, Peninsula Healthcare District, and our organization, The Parent Venture. Tonight's format is going to be pretty straightforward. We'll be having a conversation with Frank Bruni and Alice Kleeman for about 40 minutes. And Alice will be guiding that conversation with questions that she has prepared and things that she's heard from her work with other parents and students. After that, we're going to open it up to you, the audience. We really hope that you will engage with us, ask questions, make comments. Um, I'm sure by now all of you are familiar with the Zoom format, but just again, for the purposes of this event, we would like you to use the chat button for comments either to us or to one another, but please do put your questions in the Q&A button. So chat for comments, resources, and links. My partner, Bev Hartman, will be putting up relevant links in the chat. And at the end of the night, we hope you will take literally two minutes to fill in a quick survey that will also be in chat. So comments and chat, questions and answers, in the Q&A button. Um, let me tell you a little bit about tonight's presenters. And again, we are so grateful both to Frank and to Alice for tonight's presentation. Frank Bruni is an American journalist, a longtime op-ed columnist for the New York Times and a CNN contributor. He is the author of three best-selling books, Born Round, a memoir about his Italian family's love of food, where You Go Is Not Who You'll Be. This is the book that brought us all here together in 2015. Um, a book about the college admissions mania and ambling into history about George W. Bush. In June of 2021, just a few months ago, Frank joined Duke University in North Carolina as an endowed professor of journalism. Welcome, Frank. We are so honored to have you with us tonight. Thank you. Alice <laughs> Thank you. Alice Kleeman, Frank's conversation partner tonight, is the award-winning former college advisor at Menlo Atherton High School in the Sequoia Union High School District. After 20 years at MA, Alice retired, but she has continued to help students find their way to college through MA, the Boys and Girls Club of the Peninsula, and the Redwood City Library. In her career, Alice was active in the National Association for College Admission Counseling, the Western Association for College Admission Counseling, and the College Board from whom she won a national award. We could not be more delighted to have Alice and Frank with us tonight. Please take it away, you two. Enjoy the conversation. Thank you so much, Charlene. And as always, I like to acknowledge uh, Charlene and her programs because they're extraordinary. And I don't know other school districts that have such a rich resource as the Parent Education Series. And I just admire the way it, it continues to be free for anyone who wants to attend. I think it's great. We can make contributions, though. Um, Frank. I am still feeling so grateful to you for your book, Where You Go Is Not Who You'll Be. And I just want our audience to know if they haven't discovered that book yet, they should discover it really soon. It's just excellent. And it has one feature that not a lot of books have, which is if you get the book, but suddenly you're super, super busy and you can't quite get to reading it, it's really one of the only books I know where the title says it all. Where you go is not who you'll be. And that wisdom, I'm so grateful to you for that. So tonight for our conversation, I was thinking what we could do is start 
where the students start with their college experience. And that is the transition from high school to college. What are some of the ways that you think students can make the best use of those early days of the transition? Summer planning, visiting the college, orientation, moving in, first meeting with an academic advisor, anything like that before they ever even enter a classroom, how can they make the most of the experience? Um, thanks for the question, Alice. That's a great question. And I just wanna thank you all for uh, inviting me to be with you tonight. And I wanna thank you, Alice, for um, agreeing to do this. I think you all know what an astonishing resource you have in Alice Clean, and I could not be a bigger fan of Alice's or um, more grateful over the years for her kind of counsel and insights. She is, even when she's not named, she is all over the book. Where you go is not who you'll be. So if you don't like it, my point is blame her, not me. I'm kidding. Um, but <laughs> right. I, Greg and Alice, I'm very sorry to interrupt just quickly. If you now see on the bottom of your Zoom screen a button, round button that says interpretation. Done. Perfect. Well done, English. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I, I, Alice knows what a fan I am. Um, you know, your question's a great one, Alice. And, and if I can just pull back for a second, I mean, one of the reasons I, I was delighted to come and talk to you all tonight is um, when I wrote the book that's been referenced, it was an argument for, um, for not getting as worked up about the specific question of where you would end up going to college or more specifically the way most people frame it, where they'll succeed in getting in. Um, and I said, especially as the book neared its end, that you are gonna be much more defined by how you use college than by which college you go to. Um, and there really aren't good books, really a book that I can think of that tells you um, in an especially helpful way how to use those years, how to approach them, beginning, as Alice said, with the summer beforehand. I think there are two main answers to the question of how best to use that summer. Um, and one is to use it in the way that is best for you. There's no one answer. What I mean by that is you are going to college and you want to arrive um, at that school. You want to begin that experience. I say arrive at that school. You may be going to college down the road from where you live, and that can be every bit as valuable and fruitful in the end as going 2,000 miles away to college. But when you begin your first year in college, you want to do so with, with as much confidence as possible and with as little unnecessary um, extra stress beyond the stress you're going to feel about your academic schedule, about your about your academic obligations, about all of those things. And so I think the most important thing to do is look at that summer and say, what can I do over the course of the summer that will allow me to begin college with no more extra stress, with, with, as, with as little stress as is possible in my situation? So for, for some students, the answer might be to make some money during the summer. If you know that one of your challenges over the college years is going to be stitching together the money necessary to meet all the college bills and to be able to kind of, you know, live decently while studying. Um, if money is your concern, then probably the best way to spend the summer before college begins is, is socking away as much money as possible. If there's a specific kind of subject matter that you know is likely to trip you up or that you're most kind of agitated about, spend the summer working those muscles, spend the summer getting ready in advance for that so that when it comes along, it isn't going to derail you or render you so anxious that you don't get the most out of the rest of the school experience. Take a good look at who you are and what you're worried about and how you can prophylactically relieve some of that stress of the first year. That has gotta be the single best thing you can do in the summer. And that's a different thing for every person. The other answer to the question is this, even though you may have looked at anywhere from three to 20 schools um, in a manner that you considered careful before you decided which to apply to and before you actually sent in your applications, um, you didn't know where you were going until all was said and done. And since then, you probably haven't taken a second even closer look at the school you're going to. The school you're going to is a trove of resources, of course options, of potential experiences beyond what you realized when you applied and when you got in. And very, very few students take a pause and survey the whole forest so they can say, which trees do I wanna make sure to tag 
as I wander or sprint through this forest. Um, I certainly did. And by the time I got to my senior year, I was still learning things about the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill that I didn't know into the spring semester of my senior year. And I remember thinking, why did I not kind of, you know, take a couple of hours, just a couple of hours, and really, really kind of huddle with this course, with this course catalog and think about the various options in front of me. Why didn't I know about X club? Why didn't I know about Y theater? If not to participate in it, I wasn't an actor, but to go see productions there. We just, we get so wound up and we go on automatic pilot. Um, and often we're just kind of running in so many different directions at once that we don't take a good hard look at what these years can offer us and, and, and make sure um, that we know about those things that we don't want to miss out on. When I visit colleges, my favorite stops are bulletin boards. And so when you get there, I know that we, everything is electronic now, but colleges still have bulletin boards and a quick tour of them when you arrive is going to tell you about all the activities that are going on. It's going to tell you about professors looking for research assistants. I'm big on bulletin boards. Yeah, and if I can interject, Alice, you're absolutely right. And actually today's bulletin board is often replicated nearly in full in various ways on the internet, right? So I, I myself am describing to some extent my own activities even as an adult, but I've watched young adults go down the rabbit hole of researching a musical group that they just that they just got into. Um, and you know, following this link to that link, this byway to that byway. I've seen them do it, you know, with movies, with books. I've seen them do it, you know, just kind of on a on a on a whether with celebrity news on BuzzFeed, there's a whole online universe that is the college you're going to, that you can get just as lost in and that you can, and that you can um, have that experience of serendipity and discovery. And so lavish the same sort of curiosity and energy and attention on that school as you might on some great pop band that you just heard a song from. I love that. That's great. And you can do that from anywhere. You can do um, it from anywhere. It's free of charge. It's free. And so you quoted a friend of yours as saying, the more you regard college as a credentialing exercise, the less likely you are to get the benefits. Would you like to elaborate on that very wise comment of a friend of yours? Yeah, that friend is much, much wiser than I am. And, and that was a beautiful way of, of saying what he was saying. He was saying something kind of literal in particular, but I think he was also saying something universal. Um, I mean, the obvious thing he was saying is if your idea of college is I am going to get this degree, I'm going to accomplish this major with this minor, I'm going to have X seal of approval, you know, in form of some, in the form of some credential or certificate or its equivalent. If you approach it in that way, you are only looking forward and you're not looking peripherally. It's like you have only central vision and no peripheral vision. He's saying that college, if it's used well, and if it's used to its great greatest benefit, is not only about the degree attained. It's not only about what you learn in the classroom or what you prove you've learned on a test. Um, it's about all the human experiences that surround that. Um, it is about the, the friendships and the acquaintances and the alliances made, because those are very often, I think most often your route to employment. Um, it's about all sorts of ancillary experiences that make you a more aware, sensitive, empathetic, and ultimately effective human being. And only so much of that happens in the classroom and only so much of that is reflected in the actual piece of paper you carry away, the credential. So that I think is, so he was saying, that, that is what he was saying. And, you know, I was, I was thinking about that quote of his because you, you were nice enough to flag me that it was something that interested you. And one way to look at it is if you spend your college experience primarily looking down into a book, into the screen of a laptop, if that is the overwhelming majority of your time, um, that's wrong. You need to also look around and up. You need to allow a great amount of serendipity to enter your college experience because, and I'm th I think we'll talk about this more with some other questions you have, but there's such a strong likelihood, any of those of us who are this far out of college can say this, 
there's such a strong likelihood that, that the best job you end up getting, the professional path you end up being on, um, is about some of the incidental stuff that happens in college and isn't about the exact script you went in with and isn't about the three pieces of paper that you resolve to get. And so if you never look up from those three pieces of paper, if you never look up from the dance steps that get you to those three pieces of paper, you are foreclosing all sorts of things that can happen to you professionally and in your life that may be the best things of all. That's what I think he was saying with that. Um, with that. Yeah, that's what he was saying very succinctly in a way that I just said very verbosely. No, I love the way you said it. And I couldn't agree more. Yes, you're on a path to something, a career, a degree, but all those things that you're doing while you're there are part of it, not just what you think you need, it, you know, what you think is required for that. Yeah, um, I mean, you, 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 are, you are at college for sure to prepare for a job in, in, in a specific or general sense. And you are at college absolutely because that is the proven path. It's one of the greatest insurance policies that you can have um, in the American economy. That's undeniable and that's fundamental and that's important. But you are also at college, not just in an ooey gooey sense to become a better human being, to become a more sensitive human being, a more aware human being, to refine interests and passions that are gonna give you great pleasure over the course of your life. Um, and if you lose sight of that, then you have squandered a fund. Then you've squandered a, a very, very valuable part of college. In your writing about this, in an article you did a while ago for the New York Times, you cite the benefits of having a mentor, while acknowledging that um, not all students have the um, confidence to approach a potential mentor. Do you have some specific advice for students who need that, that little extra boost of confidence to connect with a faculty member or with a, an advisor? Yeah, I, I think what's important is it sounds, um, it can sound like an errand or an obligation or an assignment, and, and it can thus sound daunting, like find a mentor. And I don't think that's the way to think of it. I don't think, because that's what makes it daunting, right? So yes, on the one hand, you very much should be alert to the possibility of, and best, better yet, find a mentor. But the way you find a mentor isn't to go say, will you be my mentor? Like that book, Are You My Mother, right? Um, <laughs> and in fact, you know, as a kind of, uh, you know, as a kind of truth of interpersonal skills, if you if you literally say that person would be my best mentor, and you go up to that person and say, "Will you be my mentor?" I guarantee you that person won't be your mentor. And if that person said yes, it's going to be a miserable experience. And because they don't know you, you don't know them. Um, part of part of a, a successful mentor mentee relationship is the kind of click that you look for in a different way in a romantic relationship. So the way to find a mentor um, is to be open to that happening and then to kind of, and then, and then to allow for a kind of organic process to take place. How, how, how is one open to it ha happening? Well, first of all, if you have the time and the inclination and there are uh, groups on campus, um, be they student government groups, be they other kinds of groups that genuinely dovetail with your interests, your passions, the things you might want to do later on, just with, just with what fires your brain. Those groups have faculty members associated with them. And yeah. you are making sure in getting involved in a group or two, you're making sure that your circle of acquaintance includes some faculty members. And you will find that you hit it off with one or two of those faculty members. Those are the people who are going to end up being your mentors you should absolutely go to faculty office hours, the office hours of a professor whose course you're taking. And it's funny because certain students just know this and do it almost to excess. And other students just kind of don't know it or decide they don't have the time for it and never show up at office hours. And I say this as someone um, who taught at Princeton and is now teaching at Duke. You want to go to office hours, even if you don't have a paper to discuss, even if there's something, even, even if it's not the case that something was just discussed in class that you didn't understand. You wanna to go to office hours to discover whether there is this adult on campus, this faculty member, this person who is already a part of your life because you're in his or her class. You wanna discover whether this is someone with whom you possibly click, who has some life advice for you in addition to 
um, instruction for you in class. And, and you just kind of want to see if that leads anywhere. In a much more strategic sense, you want to go to office hours because it is human nature that a professor is going to end up giving the benefit of the doubt to a student who's gone the extra step, seems genuinely interested. And I mean, professors are people too who has flattered that professor. I will never forget, and I think I put this in the book, um, one of the many successful people I interviewed for that book to kind of say like, how did you do it? Like, what about your college experience is relevant you know, for today's young people, for anyone, for the rest of us? And I remember Condoleezza Rice, who of course rose eventually to be George W. Bush's Secretary of State. Um, she told me that she would make a point of going to a professor's office hours, but she would do two other things. She would always sign up if it was a sign up or she would show up for the start of those office hours because she knew that professor was gonna be feeling a lot more energetic and happy in the first 15 minutes than the last half hour after having had possibly 10 other students go in. And she would do the equivalent in her day. And it was harder then because we didn't have the internet. She would do the equivalent of going online, learning a little bit about that professor. If there was something easy enough to read a little snippet of reading it, and working it into the conversation because she understood professors are people too. They like to be buttered up. They like to be seen and acknowledged. And I will tell you from the professor's end, um, when that happens, I can usually smell someone who is executing a strategy, but you know what? I respect that they took the time to hatch the strategy and to execute it. Um, so those are some thoughts on how you end up with a mentor you make a whole set of decisions that expose you to adults on campus, that incline those adults to see you favorably. And then you look up and say, well, who am I having the most natural organic conversations with? Who seems to genuinely like me? And whom do I like enough to say, hey, would you mind answering my question about advice X, Y, or Z? And I guarantee you that will lead to a mentor. And that mentor will lead to some stuff that you would not have experienced without a mentor. You know, I just had a memory from long ago. I never thought I was executing a strategy when I did this, but I remember my freshman year of college, there were freshman seminars and everybody wanted to be in one and they were very competitive and selective. And I remember being interviewed by the professor for mine. I swear I did not do this as a strategy, but at the end I said, thank you so much for your time. I know your seminar will be great. If I'm not admitted to your seminar, do you think I could have the reading list? Because I would like to read the books that will be read in the seminar. Well, I got into that seminar. I'm shocked. <laughs> But I wasn't no, but that's thinking well done. Of yeah. dressing up or yeah. anything. Well, well uh, you said something, and you that that's a great story, Alice. And you said something crucial, which is you didn't realize you were ex executing a strategy, and you weren't. And that is perfect. That can be the most effective thing at all. But it leads me back to something else. If you are following at every step of the experience, if you are following your most genuine passions and you are trying to get into a course that you genuinely want to take, you were genuinely interested. That's why that wasn't a strategy. That's yeah. why that was real. If you are following your passions and just making sure you are super engaged in your environment, you don't then need another specific strategy. Your strategy is encoded in that yeah. and it's going to be fine. It was a linguistic seminar yeah. and I was so interested in it. Okay, well, let's take a little turn here. Um, do you have any particular advice for students who might have started college last year remotely and are now heading to campus or to students whose education was interrupted in any way by the pandemic? What, what will be different from them? How, what do they need to do to jumpstart their college experience? So I don't have any practical advice for that because this is terra incognita for all of us, right? I mean, no one, no one knows exactly how that's going to feel or how that's going to work um, because, because there's, there's, there's just no precedent for what happened over the last, you know, 18 months. Um, I mean, and I, I see that at Duke, I wasn't there for the remote portion of it. Um, but I'm sort of kind of baffled and stymied every day because I'm teaching a seminar of, of 15 students this semester. And um, we're, we're, we're in person, which they're very grateful for because they didn't like being remote last year. 
And all I see as someone who wasn't remote last year is, is, is a very difficult situation where they can't read my facial expressions because I'm masked. I can't read their facial expressions to their mask. It was hell to learn those 15 names as quickly as I wanted to because I had much less information. I had a name and eyes, that was it, you know? A student came into my office the other day, we're like five, six weeks into the semester, came into my office the other day and because I had cookies um, and asked him if he wanted a cookie, he took a cookie, he lowered his mask to eat it. And I literally said inside my head, that's not your face because I had known him for five weeks from his eyes, my brain had somehow assumed the rest of his face and it turned out he looked nothing like what in my brain huh. I had sketched in. My point is like, this is a bizarre and surreal time in American life. And it's a bizarre and surreal time in higher education. So practically, I don't know what to tell those students, but emotionally, my advice, which I'm gonna kind of first render in what sounds brutal, but I don't mean it, is get over it. And what I mean by that is everybody, in college. Some, some young people were lucky enough to have two years before a year went away. So when they come back to campus, it's a kind of return to a normalcy they recognize. Other people didn't get their first year and are starting in their second year. Everybody you are there with lost a year. Everybody you are there with was disrupted. And I get really concerned because in a very human and understandable way, I meet a lot of young people who are very focused on what was taken away from them because something was taken away from them, who are very focused on the way in which the rhythm of the whole experience was thrown off because the rhythm of the whole experience was thrown off. But that happened to everyone and it happened, it's done. So I think the most important thing is to look forward and not backward and to realize that whatever disorientation you feel is multiplied and shared through all of your peers so the kind of thing that would be the greatest human concern just by dint of human nature, which is I'm now behind the game, everybody's behind the game, right? Everybody had the same thing happen. So my, my, my big piece of advice, and it's a, it's a kind of obvious and maybe a, a dumb piece of advice, but I really, really think it's essential, is do not focus on what didn't go according to plan and on what was lost because that's done and because that happened to everyone. Just move on. That's not bad advice for life in general. <laughs> I, I wish I followed it better myself, but it's always <laughs> easier to give advice than to live it. So what are your thoughts about the ways students go about choosing their coursework and choosing their major? Um, I, I think many students do it thoughtfully. I think most students do it thoughtfully. Um, many students do it with deeper thought than others. But I also think that many students fall into certain kind of traps or default positions um, that I think they should pause and be aware of and think about. Um, I had a student uh, come in to me recently um, and tell me that his plan was to go to law school. He's a senior at Duke uh, and he's very, very bright and has great grades. And, and my assumption based on what little I know about him is that he'll get into the law school of his choice. And he said to me kind of with a laugh and he was, because he was puzzled by himself and he was looking for my reaction. I think he was looking for a constructive reaction. And he said, he has no idea why he's going to law school except it just seems like the kind of thing someone like him does, right? Yeah. Um, I don't think he's an outlier. I mean, for him, that something is law school. I think a lot, too, a lot, too many young people go to college and they have a sense of what they're supposed to do what they're supposed to do because what people have told them about themselves to that point, what their strengths and weaknesses are, what they've been told, what they're supposed to do culturally, what they're supposed to do within the context of their family's expectations. What you're supposed to do is very likely not what you're going to be best at and what's going to make you happiest. So for starters, when you're thinking about your course of study in college, when you're thinking about your major, if it is coming to you because it feels like the thing you're supposed to do, stop yeah. and think twice, three times, four times about that. Um, also because I said one of the things that makes it what you're supposed to do is it seems to fit what people have told you you're good and bad at. You're 18, 19, 17 years old. You still don't know everything that you're good or bad at. And if you think that the clay has fixed in place and been baked at 18, and you operate accordingly, you are selling yourself short 
um, and you are misunderstanding kind of human development and human nature. I mean, I mentioned Condi Rice before, and, and I just have to go back to her because she's a perfect example of this. She was a musical prodigy who chose to go to the college she went to because it had a great conservatory. And she was 100% sure that she was gonna spend her life as a professional musician playing the piano. She was a piano prodigy. And when she got to college and that bigger stage, she realized she wasn't as exemplary, as exceptional, as extraordinary at the piano as she thought, um, but that she had these other interests. And she just out of curiosity took a course in international relations and boom, the road fork, and she went in one direction and found an entirely different life, person, and career. No matter what you think of her politics, she achieved much in terms of goals and in terms of her stature in life. Um, she wouldn't have if she hadn't let go of what she was supposed to do. Yeah. So that's one big concern I have about the way students choose majors. Um, I also think um, students for understandable reasons and sometimes for necessary and unavoidable reasons will choose a major that is about setting themselves up for X surefire job the minute they graduate. Um, that can be unavoidable and that can sometimes be smart, but that too, I think, warrants a pause because you need to remember the economy changes constantly. You may be setting yourself up for a job in an industry that is gonna start shrinking when you're out of college and that is gonna be shrunken greatly 10 years hence. Sorry, did you hear that? Yeah, it's thunder. It sounded like an explosion, but you're right, it's thunder. Um, Alice asked earlier where my dog is. I think my dog is gonna make an appearance below my feet any second because she's gonna be freaked out by that. Um, anyway, I apologize for the sound effects. No, my whole house shook, so I was just like, whoa. Um, uh, but you know, if, if, you, if you have the wiggle room, the freedom to major in or double major in something that is simply about cultivating um, cultivating the powers, like that is about becoming a better thinker, about a better communicator, something that is just about intellectual development. Um, I think you want to stay nimble and I think you want to kind of follow the course that's going to make you the best, nimblest, most engaged and eager learner. Because the chances are in a world that changes as rapidly as ours does, the chances are you may have several careers and the best tool you can pick up in college isn't a, a specific credential to go back to that word, but is a capacity to, to learn and to change that is gonna serve multiple careers in an ever-changing economy. You know, I, everything you say brings up little anecdotes for me. I just thought of two. One is when my son was in college, um, he was about to start his senior year and I just took a glance at his transcript to, to see what the classes were that, and he had not planned this, but I pointed out, hey, each quarter you have taken one course for your major, which was philosophy, one course to complete a requirement, and one course just because shouldn't everybody learn about Indonesian gamelan playing or poetry? One course, just like, I don't know about this, let me try. And I loved that he did that almost accidentally. The other thing, what you were saying earlier about what you should be or what you think is, is a story about my older daughter. All three of my kids are teachers in this local school district here. And my daughter wanted to be a teacher from the age of five. She knew nothing else. She loved everything about it. And all through high school, she was one of the top students in her class. All through high school, people said, why would you wanna teach? Or that's, a, that's dumb or, um, but look, you're so smart. Why would you become a teacher? And I said to her, you know what? Don't you worry about it. You're gonna to get to college and you're gonna have all the encouragement that you want to become a teacher and to become a great teacher. So she went off to college and the first or second week phoned me in tears. I just had my first meeting with my advisor. And he said, you wanna be a teacher? Why would you wanna be a teacher? Are you sure you don't wanna plan for med school or law school? I said, That's, this is an easy problem to fix. 
you need a different advisor. But I was, <laughs> <laughs> and she did, and it was fine. And she studied and became a teacher. But I think that the people around you, the advisors and the, the professors, they may not realize the impact that they have with trying to direct students. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, that's a really good point. And I think sometimes, um, sometimes students too readily kind of see judgment to those sorts of, to, to people who aren't necessarily um, listening and responding the way they could and should, yeah. Um, would your advice about how to go about getting the most out of college be identical for the student who begins in a community college as for the student who begins in a four-year college? I'm a pretty big fan of beginning at a community college, especially here where they're so excellent and where a student's options are beautifully reopened if they do that. Would your advice about getting the most out of it be different in any way? Not really, because I mean, the, the only difference is they've got a shorter time at, at, at the college they end up with after the community college. You know, the community college was part of the college experience. And I think, I think that student faces the extra sort of psychological or emotional burden, which is sort of analogous to what we talked about, about people coming out of the year of COVID, where it's very difficult to shake the sense that you're a little bit behind um, it's very difficult to shake the sense that you've missed out on stuff that other people have experienced. And then it is difficult. You are joining a community, a, a large community, um, in which many people have had a year or two years or, or, or three years to find their homes and their place, and you are a latecomer. Um, and that is going to be difficult in some ways socially that can't be avoided. Um, and I think that's all hard. So what I think is, is, is really important for a community college transfer student is, is to make the firm and committed decision not to focus on that and be, uh, and be overwhelmed by that, not to kind of dwell on those negatives because those, are, those have happened, those can't be changed. And there are so many positives in joining this new environment. I, I'm with you. I think that, um, and this is something else that I think is important for community college students to understand. I think it's something that for many of them has been a, a college saving, um, a life building step that should not be looked at as something to put them behind the eight ball. I have a nephew who's college, he's, he's now in his third year of college. Um, his first year was at a community college and he was quite frankly, um, not ready to go to a full-fledged college when he got out of, uh, out of high school. That community college year was so crucial to his building of confidence. It was so crucial to just for him to have one more year of maturation into an adult. Um, and so uh, I, like you, do not see community college as any sort of kind of uh, consolation prize. But some people going from community college to college worry that it is or worry that it will be seen as such that is a kind of psychological, emotional, social challenge. And the only answer to that challenge is to realize that's the path you're on, that's the path you took, uh, and to worry excessively about whether it has put you behind is to fall further behind. It's very similar to what you said about the COVID experience. Yeah. Move yeah. forward. So what are some of the areas where students who have fewer resources, less money, less time because they have jobs, less experience in their families with higher education. What are some of the ways those students can maximize their college experience, essentially making up for lost time or lost experience? And they may still even have less time while they're at college. Yeah. You know, I, I've several times used and used several times you I've several times used and used several times several times used. Um, the word loss or lost, right? And it's a word we all use all the time because it's a convenient one and it's 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 a, it's it's useful in it. Um, I think we have to get away from that word. I was thinking as you were asking the question because almost anything that we're talking of as a, that, that can be viewed as a loss um, can also be viewed as a gain, or there are gains in that loss, right? Um, in an ideal world, uh, a student, um, in, in the world I wish we lived in, no student would have to worry about generating income toward his or her college experience. Um, 
and, and would be able to decide to work or not work and be able to decide what kind of work to do, to do during college based not on economic need. I wish that was the case. That would be ideal. It's not the way most people go to college. Um, and the fact that they have to work doesn't need to be seen, I think, or doesn't always have to be a distraction or a loss. There are a lot of different ways to work during college. Um, there are ways uh, to choose employment experiences um, that can be framed as and spun into essential bits of preparation for what you apply to do going forward. Um, and I mean, that's true in one basic sense. I mean, I don't know of a single person who's ever looked at uh, resumes, transcripts, and not been impressed by someone whose grades, whose great grades exist in tandem with having worked 20 to 30 hours while going to school. That resume, that, that transcript, that CV, whatever you wanna call it, automatically looks different from the Dean's List CV of someone who clearly had to worry about nothing but going to the library. Um, so are you at a disadvantage? Yes, in some ways, but that disadvantage can, if you tell this, if, if you, market yourself thoughtfully, if you tell that story in the right way, that disadvantage can be converted into its own advantage. Um, and what you're doing for work, there may be nothing available to you that will bring money in that is directly related to the career that you've set your sights on. But there may be stuff that is at least obliquely related. There may be choices you can make within that need to work that will, again, um, put you in a position where you are um, extra marketable, where you stand out in a very particular way from your peers, where you've picked up skills um, that are going to invariably be useful in the in the in any number of professions and in the profession that you are looking at. And so, um, I think you want to say to yourself, within the confines of needing to make money, of needing to be off campus, that's often of needing to move my concentration and energy away from my studies X often, can I move it to places where it's still gonna be beneficial to my development as a human being, um, to my preparation for the career I'm looking at, um, to the CV resume transcript I'm putting together to say, please hire me. Um, yes, that might take a little more looking and it's gonna to be totally worth it. The financial aid expert who helps us at Menlo Atherton High School has, often cited a study, and I wish I could cite it correctly here, but that says that um, students who work while in college, um, 14 hours a week or fewer hours than that, not only do fine in college, but do better in college. And the minute you cross that to 15 and over puts a student at risk. So that's another thing to, um, think about. Um, I've got about two or three more questions, and then we'll look at some of the questions coming in from others. I'm, I'm curious what you think is the impact on today's college students of all of the sort of social, economic, and political divisions or divisiveness in our country right now. Can students still find in college a place where all opinions are valued? And, and how is that related to getting the most out of college? Um, that, is, that is a concern. Um, and I think when students feel like they have to speak or behave only in one very particular way, I, I do think it diminishes the college experience because I think um, the ideal college experience um, is about kind of trying and failing and, 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 and sometimes uh, speaking and being sloppy in ways that make you learn uh, to be a more thoughtful, considerate, better person. Um, I think the ideal college experience has you uh, encountering all sorts of ideas, including uncomfortable and unappealing ones, so that you can figure out how to respond to them and so you can better articulate and understand why those values don't match your own. And that is a problem with the college experience at many colleges and universities today. Um, it is not the problem everywhere. And I say as a member of the media, um, I think we have, we have latched onto a correct storyline, but we have 
um, exaggerated and amplified that storyline beyond the reality of most college students' lives. Most, most of the students at Middlebury College were not chasing Charles Murray out of that auditorium. That was, that was a small group. And yet that became like this rep for the media and for many, uh, you know, for commentators that became the representative example of what college is like today. I mentioned Charles Murray and Middlebury, maybe people are, remember that or are aware of it. That's very present to me because I think the speaker at middle, the first speaker at Middlebury after the Charles Murray incident was me. And I remember going there and being told, well, we don't know how this is going to go. And I gave a speech that was very much about ideological diversity, um, about the need to um, engage with people across a broad spectrum of experiences and sensibilities. Um, and I gave it carefully. And I found that the students asked thoughtful questions. They did not shout at me. They were not defensive toward me. Um, I, I found a college environment that I thought was very, very conducive to learning. Um, I think that this varies a lot from institution to institution. And while we're talking more about getting the most out of college and not how to choose college, we are talking to an audience of parents and students who will be choosing college. Um, I think you should look at the college you're choosing through the prism of, um, is that going to be a place where I'm going to encounter um, diversity in all its forms? Am I going to, am, am I going to encounter not only um, racial diversity, which is super important. Am I going to encounter socioeconomic diversity? Am I going to encounter ideological diversity? Um, that is something that you can seek in a college uh, in, in, just the way, in just the same way that you seek a place that has beautiful quadrangles. And it's more important than beautiful quadrangles. Um, because we are at a moment in time um, where some conversations are censored. Some students don't feel comfortable um, wrestling with certain ideas in public. Um, and that I, I cannot say that that's a good thing, that is an unideal thing, but one can point oneself, point oneself toward an environment where that's less likely to be suffocating versus more likely. You must be psychic because you just sort of answered my next question without my having asked it. So instead of putting it as a question to you, I'm going to put it out to everybody who's listening to us um, as something to really think hard about. I have often, always, in fact, advised students to find a college where they feel both comfortable and uncomfortable. And when I tell them that, they kind of look at me like I'm crazy, which actually they do pretty frequently anyway. But I was going to ask you, what were your thoughts about student comfort and discomfort in relation to getting the most out of the college experience? And I think you just answer it. If a student came back to see me after four years in college and said, I never felt uncomfortable once, I would think of that as not the college experience I would have hoped for them. I'm going to ask you some of the questions that are coming in. I'm going to choose some of the ones that are relevant to the most people. But before we go to those, uh, would you like to just say a little bit about the new book you're working on and when we will be able to read it? I know it's not about college, but I would love for you to to tell us about it. Um, okay, I'll be, I'll be brief since it's not about college, thank you. Um, uh, it is pretty much finished. I mean, we have to proofread pages. It'll be out in, um, in March, March 1st. I, don't, I still don't understand why publishing lead times are so long. Um, it's a book called The Beauty of Dusk uh, and the subtitle is On Vision Lost and Found. And it's a book that is in some measure about affliction and aging. Um, it is, it is the story in part of a medical and sort of emotional odyssey that I went through when a little over four years ago, I woke up one morning and I had, I had lost all functional vision in my right eye. Um, and in very short order, I was told not only that what had happened to me was irreversible and untreatable, um, but I was also told that there was a 20% chance it would happen in my other eye. And so I had to, I had to kind of really think about the possibility, and I still have to think about the possibility that I will quote unquote go blind. Um, and I in part tell that story in terms of what it was like to ride that roller coaster and what it was like um, uh, to go through that medically. I, I ended up in several FDA approved clinical trials, one of which involved needles in my eyeball, one of which involved um, one of which involved a six month uh, period where I had sharps containers and needles in my home and injected myself. Uh, you know, in the belly or the thigh twice a week, and I had vials in my fridge, and 
I, I became someone who, who I cannot thread a needle. I can barely tie my shoes. I'm the least dexterous human being in the world. And yet I became a whiz at preparing a syringe and injecting myself. So probably a third to a half of the book is that story. But the rest of it is about the different sorts of conversations I began having with people in my life and with people I was meeting and with people I sought out um, about how you deal with hardship, about how you deal with uncertainty, about how you deal with certain sorts of kind of limits and variables that, that are a big part of aging, but that some of us go through a little earlier because we get this sort of accelerated course in aging. Um, and so it is what I think is ultimately an affirming book about learning how to um, deal with hardship, with limits, with uncertainty, with affliction um, in ways that become blessings rather than curses. I cannot wait to read the aging stuff. <laughs> um, I hope I'll still be around to read the aging stuff. We're going to um, keep you around, Alice. We're going to make sure that. <laughs> I really love one of the questions that has come in here. Um, it's about students who are shy or anxious or introverted or inhibited. Um, there must be some special ways for those students to make the most out of their college experience. Um, I, I've talked to so many students who feel that way and they wonder if their introversion is going to be a downside for them. And I know and I've seen that it is not. What are your thoughts about that? You know, I don't know. I mean, I feel like that's well outside my, my kind of expertise and I kind of hate to spout off on things that I you know, really don't know much about. So my answer to that is just more of a human answer than, than one that's informed by kind of reporting or any kind of knowledge or expertise. But I mean, it's a poignant question because it, we, can, we can try to change things about ourselves. You know, we can, we can work on various aspect of our, aspects of ourselves, but you know, as, um, as any parent of fraternal twins will tell you, uh, there are certain things that are just pure nature and not subject to nurture, you know, because you have two, Fraternal twins are raised in the same environment and often are wildly different people because they're just constituted. Their, their constitution is different. Some people are introverts. Some people, no matter how hard they try or no matter how much they worry about paying a price for that introversion, introversion can't change that. Um, it is going to lead to a different college experience. It is going to cut certain things off. Um, but, you know, um, not to sound too Cheryl Sandbergian here, you can kind of lean into your introversion. You know, there's, there's a wonderful, wonderful book that I'm betting a third of the people listening have read because it was a huge bestseller, deservedly yeah. so, called Quiet. You knew what I was going to mention. Yeah. And what I think is so great about Quiet is not just that it, it um, exalts uh, introversion. Um, but it's a good example of a theme that has run through our entire conversation tonight and that is at the center of the book that I'm about to put out there. You can turn hardship into blessing. You can turn loss into gain. Your introversion is cutting you off from all sorts of social experiences that would make would invariably make you a better networker um, and would invariably bring some opportunities your way that aren't gonna, but your introversion is also gonna give you a stillness a separateness, an ability to be alone um, that can be used to acquire a whole bunch of information and to do a whole depth of thinking that the gadfly isn't doing, that the extrovert, can, that the extrovert can't do any better than you can be an extrovert. So I think there's kind of a way to embrace what you may see as your disadvantage or your peculiarity. Um, and make it something of an advantage to, you know, to, to, to go back to what we were saying before. I, I, just, I just think that's a theme that runs through so much of life that runs through this conversation tonight. And that I think runs through the college experience. There's very little that happens in terms of where you end up going or in terms of how you have to go there that can't be spun and not just through mental trickery that can't be spun in a positive direction. You, you know, um on this question of introversion, I know we're not talking about applying to college, but I have encouraged so many students who were afraid that what colleges are looking for is only the raging dynamos 
and not the introverts. And I know for a fact that if it weren't for the quieter people, the more thoughtful people, the people who need more time to themselves, you would not have the same quality of community. So I've often helped students think about how to write about that. No, I think it, I think it would actually be powerful um, in a college essay. Again, we're not strategizing college essays, but you know, I mean, so I, I'm so I'm teaching at Duke. I have 15 students in my class. Duke, I think you know, those infernal U.S. News and World Report rankings just came out again, and I think Duke is ranked as the ninth, you know, best university in the country. It's in the top 10. I am sure its acceptance rate is below 15 percent. I have not looked. It's probably below 13 percent. My point being those 15 students in my Duke class um, are the envy of many of their peers. Uh, and clearly it was uh, not easy to, to be in this class, to be admitted to Duke. And I'm telling you, just as many of those students are introverts as extroverts, I watch them in class. There are some of them whose hands shoot up and they can't wait to say, that, wait, wait to say their piece and they are 100% confident that every syllable that comes out of their mouths is absolute pearl of wisdom. There are as many students in that class whom I can visibly see struggling um, to screw up the poise and the courage to join the conversation to the degree that they know they're supposed to. Um, and they got into Duke and they're doing fine at Duke and they're gonna go into the world with a Duke degree. The world accommodates, a college accommodates all sorts of people because the world accommodates all sorts of people. Well, well, speaking of accommodating, Charlene, I think you're back there somewhere. We talked about having this be a 60 minute um, presentation, but there are some other really great questions. Can we respect um, people who would need to leave and bow out now because it's six o'clock, but go on for just a little bit more? Yes, if that's okay with you, Frank, let's proceed. There's so many great questions. You've already answered so many great questions, but those of you, again, thank you who joined us who need to move on now after an hour. This video will be available soon on our video library, courtesy of our friends at the Boys and Girls Club. Um, proceed, thank you both. Okay, thanks. We'll do, we'll do maybe 10 minutes more, thank you. Um, so there, there's one here, well, I'm gonna throw this one in. Um, teachers seem to be observing that um, since COVID, kids are less mature um, emotionally and socially. So after a year and a half at home, there's been some behavioral aggression. Mm -hmm. How do you think that's going to play out in colleges? And how do you think it's going to play out for those students who need to kind of get it together um, after? Well, you know, that, that's a question I really, I mean, that, that feels to me like, um, like, like a school psychologist question. I, re I really don't know. I mean, um, so I have no idea how that's going to be play, play out. The only thing I can tell you, um, and this is, of course, from the vantage point of um, an extraordinarily affluent uh, school of considerable conventional stature, which is Duke. Um, and I saw the same thing at Princeton, but I think this does, I think this is true of a lot of schools. Um, we're in an era where college is much more so than when I went to school. Um, are more attentive to and more invested in the emotional health of their students. Um, student mental health services are like many exponentially, exponentially more robust, uh, better staffed, better funded um, than they were in my day. So I don't know how it's going to be going to play out, but one positive feeling I have is that is that schools are going to be cog colleges are going to be cognizant of it and they're going to move to address it in a way that they wouldn't have 10 or 20 years ago just as a function of the changing sophistication in at colleges about mental health issues and and, and development issues and just kind of as a function of the changing nature of culture of, of colleges and even the change nature of colleges relationship to their students colleges um, in ways that are largely good, but sometimes not, um, are constantly asking themselves what they owe their students almost as consumers. Um, and that can lead to some weird stuff like, like, you know, money invested in lazy rivers running through campus, but it also leads to some really good stuff like making sure um, that there is counseling across many different fronts, making sure, I mean, 
I see Duke, Duke like is, is again my example, and it's 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 not a perfect, it's not a emblematic example because it's a school with more resources than others. But I mean, I see in the in the emails I get that come from the provost, that come from the university president, that come from uh, the dean of the school of public policy in which I teach, there is constant thought. Um, and constant communication to students about what they might be going through as a result of this peculiar passage of time, what they might need. And while Duke may be a particularly um, admirable example of that, I don't think it's an outlier in terms of that general desire and sensibility in higher education. It's not, and even pre-COVID, um, the increase in sensitivity of college um, uh, health, and psychological counseling, the advances are incredible. Yeah. And I, what you just said reassured me a little bit or a lot. And I'm sure that that's true elsewhere too. Um, back to something you were talking about earlier. Um, one of our um, audience members has pointed out that close to the idea of doing what you're supposed to do is the trap of doing what you're good at in part because society rewards you for that. And in your conversations with other people, how would you say successful people have negotiated that? That's a well, really the, interesting- Well, the most, um, and it's funny, it's kind of a, 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 an internal kind of side mental passion I have, like what is the secret sauce to, to, to really successful people? Um, and there are elements of that secret sauce that are not admirable. Sometimes I think it's shamelessness in a lot of people. Um, but that's the, that's the bad answer, but the, the successful people, when I look at the positive, and by the way, that's not all successful people. Um, when I look at the positive, um, they are those, the, the most successful people. And by successful, I mean, not only have they achieved at a high level within what they've chosen to do, but they're happy. I mean, I, let's talk first about the definition of success. I don't think success is three homes, two boats, uh, et cetera, if you're not happy. I, I don't think that's success at all. I think that's the opposite. I think success is fulfillment, you know, which often does have an enormous material component and there's no shame in that. Um, but when I see people who are operating, let's say, let's, so let's say saying successful, except people who are operating at a very high level in their professions, I see people who have found not just what they're good at or primarily what they're good at, but I, I see people at the confluence of something they're good at and what really makes them tick, right? More important than their being good at that is they're having an outsized gusto for it. Because if you are operating at a very high level in whatever field you're in, you are I guarantee you throwing more than 35 hours a week at it. And you're able to do that because that does not feel like a horrible sacrifice or like, or like a slog. Um, you are someone who is creative in that field and you are creative because you are so genuinely engaged that the ideas of that field, ways to do things are always pinging around your mind. Um, so what you're good at is a trap if it's the only question you ask. If you ask, what am I good at and also really jazzed about, then that's no trap at all. I'm just thinking if someone had told me uh, when I finished college that I would work with teenagers, love every minute of it and have a passion for it, I would have just laughed. It never would have occurred to me that I would either love it or be good at it. And uh, I've known so many people who over the course of their lives have changed their minds about what they want to do. And, um, it, you know, we don't have a deadline. You will graduate from college and at that time you will know everything you need to know about the rest of your life. But I think a lot of students feel like, we do have a deadline and we're supposed to learn it there, know it there, and then do it. Um, one, uh, one other question is, um, do you think it's easier to make the connections with faculty at smaller schools? I'll just say I don't for a number of reasons because I know how students can make a small school feel bigger and how students can make a big field school feel smaller. What do you think? 
Um, I agree with you. Uh, I think I think it may, in certain circumstances, you know, as a sheer kind of matter of, of arithmetic, be a little bit easier to smaller school, but um, right. A larger school is going to have more faculty. So for starters, like small school, large school is not exactly the right schematic because the real question is how many faculty per students, right? And that can be that can be the same ratio at a small school as a large school. So that's that's one important aspect of the arithmetic that needs to kind of be remembered or, or corrected or whatever. Um, I I found uh, at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, which is an enormous school. Um, I found that you can be at an, at an enormous school, but it, not all of those students are um, going to the professor's office hours, vying for that professor's attention, um, speaking up and speaking intelligently in class. And you can end up standing out more in that crowd because there are so many people who aren't trying that you end up being more fully on a professor's radar than if you are one of like 12 students who are all of the same kind of bent, who are all vying for that professor's attention, um, you know, who, who, who are all kind of making the same mark. Um, so I don't think there's any real tidy answer to that. Um, I also think that when you get to a large school, there are many small classes at large schools. Duke is a pretty large school. I'm teaching a class of 15 students this semester, and I'm doing a new class next semester that I'm limiting to 12 students. Now, again, Duke is, Duke is more affluent, has more resources than some schools, but you will find small classes at every school. You will find breakout sessions at every school. Um, you will find routes to professors at every school that are not crowded highways. I'm just remembering that in my college experience, my favorite classes had 400 people in them. And I loved uh, being that anonymous person among those 400, listening to someone and feeling free to do with that what I wanted. But in my major, my classes were sometimes two of us, sometimes three of us, sometimes a really big class of seven. That's a, cl so, that's a, cl that's a classic example. And, yeah. and so also important to remember in your class of 400 or in the classes I took at UNC so many years ago that were over 150 or whatever, those classes had multiple teaching assistants oh, yes. who interacted with you. And those were grad students, usually grad students who are fairly far along, often PhD candidates. Yes. When we talk about mentors, mentors are not only tenured professors or for that matter, associate professors or for that matter, adjunct professors. Tenures are people who are a little ahead of you in the game, um, who have kind of paved a little bit of a path that they can yank you down, um, who have a set of um, associations or contacts that widens your world. All of those things can apply to the teaching assistant slash PhD candidate Absolutely. who is in your 10 person breakout session. That person can be a, an even more valuable mentor than the august professor. Well, and they are the august professors of tomorrow. There's a right. woman who was a teaching assistant in one of my classes in the breakout session. We, I forget what we call them, but um, sections we call them. Tutorials, right? And we call them sections. Yeah. And I see that person now on CNN, MSNBC, quoted very famous book she's written. And she was a grad student when um, when she taught a section. So I'm right. going to ask you one last question because it's kind of a futuristic question. Do you have any thoughts about how COVID and everything we've been through is going to affect the behavior of future generations of college students? Many have had to delay or change their plans or take gap years or move to a college closer to home. Do you think students are going to be more resilient because of this? I hope so. I mean, I think that is certainly one way in which what looks like a loss could become a gain. Um, I think, you know, I, I think students have, have been through um, a challenge rougher uh, than any I faced during high school, any, any that I faced that kind of came from external, it was external, it was national, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and, I, and I do think it's possible, I hope so, that many have taken away some really kind of profound and fundamental life lessons and uh, about how little we can ultimately predict, um, about what we do control and what we don't control um, and, and, and what we should kind of learn from that. 
Um, I do think COVID is going to end up changing higher ed because I think in ways that won't be immediate because it's going to take some time for the dust, dust to settle and it's going to take some time for the evidence to be sifted through and analyzed and, and understood. Um, but COVID made schools of all kinds all across the country improvise in ways they hadn't before. There was, there, was, there was online learning where it didn't exist before. There were hybrid classes where they didn't exist before. Um, there were allowances made uh, in terms of, okay, you can um, go away for a semester and come back. You can go away for two semesters and come back. Um, more gap years were taken. And I think we'll be able, once, once we're a little bit less emotional about it, once the dust has settled, as I said, I think we'll be able to kind of look back at the laboratory of, of these 18 months. Um, and I think there is going to be some, I think there are gonna be some kind of creative experiments, creative solutions, um, and some sort of uh, flexible, there are gonna be multiple ways, multiple ways to go to school more so than there are now. And those will have come out of um, the experiences, the lessons learned, what failed and what worked um, during the COVID period. I, I think it's gonna end up having a very profound long lasting effect on higher education, but I don't know that we're gonna see it instantly. I think there'll be a little bit of a lag. And to me, that's a, a hopeful sign because it means totally. that it's not a quagmire where nothing is going to change, but um, you know, creativity has found its way into higher education. We, one way to think about this, and I think this is good, um, for a long time, even though it was not the way the overwhelming majority of Americans went to school, for a long time, the college mythology has been very narrow and cinching. And it has been four years at this campus of brick or stone buildings surrounding a quadrangle. And that has for a long time now been a lie in the sense that most students don't graduate in four years. Most students aren't at residential colleges that look like something out of a Hollywood movie set, right? Um, I think the COVID experience has forced us to recognize that in a particular way. Um, we've kind of grown up in our understanding of how um, haphazard, slapdash, those aren't really the right words, but we've grown up in our understanding of just how many forms college can take and just about uh, how what college is, is so much more than that almost, than that, than that fraudulent and almost cloying myth. I think that's good. I think that's good too. And I think you are great. And I thank you. I don't agree you. with that part, but I agree with that. I thank that. you so much for joining us for this talk tonight. I, I've learned a lot. I'm sure our audience has. I'm so grateful to you for talking to us about this important topic. Thank you. Well, I love and respect you, Alice, and I'm delighted to have this time. If it was just with you, I'd be delighted with it, but it's nice to... <laughs> That'll happen. <laughs> okay, and thank you, Charlene. Well, we have to say a huge virtual thank you to Frank Bruni and Alice Kleeman for everything tonight. We learned so much. Everybody's been writing to say thank you. They can't wait to watch it again. So take care, everybody. Stay well. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Hope to see you soon.